I want to bring in Michael Brown, who is at the AWS reInvent show. Hey, how's it going, Michael? Man, doing just great. How are you guys doing? Uh, man, awesome, bro. Hey, I really, I really appreciate you joining us. So, do you, you want to? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and just turn it over to you. What are your thoughts? You know, where are you? Why are you there? What are your thoughts? And what should our community be aware of in terms of any of the big announcements coming out of the keynote at AWS reInvent here just in the last hour? Sure. So um, I'm actually sitting out here. We have the uh, the AWS Industries uh, like lounge and tent here. So inside of here is like all kinds of demonstrations. We got robotics. There's some sort of EV car over here, and it's everything from manufacturing to energy to 5G. Like there's an entire like demo area here for for industry. And this is at reInvent. This is an IT conference. Um, you know, speaking of that at the keynote. Uh, uh, Cedric, the uh, the CEO of, uh, of of digital at Siemens, was one of the speakers, right? So he came on, and really just talking about the the relationship that Siemens has with AWS. That that, that this is their horse that they're going to ride, and uh, you know they really had three killer, you know, three points. Is number one, they're taking all of Siemens industrial software and putting on AWS. They want to make it so that it's not just the Fortune 500 or the Fortune 250 that can afford. Um, you know, the, these, these high-end applications. They want to put it on AWS and make it so that startups, small businesses can use the same software. Um, they're really looking for, you know, something that's, you know, near and dear to all of our heart is, you know, unleashing the data. He, he made a statement. I was going to go look it up. He said an average, you know, mid-sized factory creates 2,200 terabytes of data a month. Like it's in the machines though. It's just sitting in the machines. Like if you think about everything that's happening and it just, the data just sits there, it's like, that's where, that's where they're coming from. So 2,200 terabytes a month and it just, nobody uses any of it, right? Yep. They want to figure out how to be able to get that out, do things with it, obviously with Siemens, right? And then um, uh, third is just, you know, being able to make it, uh, being able to scale with things like Mendix, right? That was their product. So he, that was his three points is, you know, being able to develop, you know, uh, applications quickly, being able to get access to the data and, and making the software available in AWS. So again, remember, IT conference, the CEO of, of Siemens Digital was here speaking at it. So, you know, these are the types of things that you got to look at. Did we have any, um, did we have any manufacturing specific announcements? No, we didn't see any new things. Now that they still could come uh, either tomorrow or Thursday. There's two more, you know, smaller keynotes, if you will. Um, so we still might get some, you know, something around TwinMaker, IoT, something like that, some sort of, you know, new capabilities. We might see that. But what we have is, uh, you know, the, the actual keynote itself is last night it started with uh, uh, Peter DeSantis, the VP of Cloud Computing. He was talking about new instance types. When we talk about data and the scale of data, dude, if you've heard me speak, sometimes I'll make this flippant comment. Um, Know that you know AWS doesn't use TCP. They provide it to the users for convenience. Um, they've now formalized that thing. It's called SRD. It's a protocol, and that protocol is so far superior. It it allows them to go from a like a T3 instance to doing five gig on a single stream of throughput to 25 gig on a single stream of throughput using just protocol, just changing that. So they're they they're they're starting to adopt that across. And so now your high end instances are get 200 gigabit in the cloud of network connectivity. It starts getting ridiculous, right? Wait, and this then, is na this is native to the AWS infrastructure. You're saying that's wow. right. Yeah, it's a, it's oh, a, basically they took this protocol SRD, and it they use it instead of TCP on the underlying capability. And it uh, what it is, it's multi. It so it, it you know what TCP does a single path, and it does it really fast. But if if something ends up in the wrong place, if it ends up in the wrong order, you know, on the other side, TCP retransmits. SRD don't care. It just sends it all. You use any path that you want as fast as you can. When it gets to the other side, we'll take care of it. And um, it just increases reliability and throughput like, like ridiculous. Well, I, so I didn't. I knew that. I knew SRD was more efficient than TCP, but I didn't know it was at that scale. I mean, that's a yeah. that's a huge exponential scale up. Yeah. Wow! Holy so, crap! Yeah, they just kind of, he just, that was, that was, that was what they threw in last night. And so then, um, uh, so Pesky today was talking about, so it's really around, you know, they, they started out with uh, sustainability, you know, talking about your ESG, you know, they've moved their timeline forward. They're going to be um, uh, energy neutral 
by 2025, right? They're 85% there today. So all of the huge data centers across all, all of the buildings, it includes the buildings, it includes where we work, where the uh, Amazon people work, all the data centers, energy, energy neutral, uh, uh, renewable energy 2025 and then water positive so you know not consuming any water whatsoever actually giving water back by 2030 so i started out with that it's pretty cool and then um they went to data so they they put some things around now this is important when we start talking about tying the uns into the data lake they put together some uh some some capabilities around the the multiple areas of, of data transformation being able to ingest the data being able to um ETL the data, right? They, somebody made the statement, or a, uh, one a customer made the statement on the screen. ETL is a, a uh, actually I wrote it down. I want to make sure I get it right. It was hysterical because I felt the exact same way. Uh, <laughs> a thankless, unsustainable black hole, like traditional ETL, because yeah. it's it's all you know one line, and and you in uh, and if the customer consumer asks for something different, you have to go change it in fifteen places, right? Right. So you know he he announced this idea of a zero ETL future. Right. So, you know, it's kind of nuanced, but when you really start thinking about the use cases, there's now an Aurora Redshift zero ETL integration. So you can be in, ingesting data into Aurora coming from a, a traditional pipeline or data sitting in Aurora on top of a thing. And that's going to be MySQL and Postgres. Um, and then it just syncs with Redshift, right? So you can actually put the transformations in Redshift and it's it's near real time, right? So they made that. That was pretty cool. Um, then they said, oh, you know, you know, Apache Spark, right? Uh, if, you know, using Spark, that's that's critical, right? That's how we do ML today or not, you know, data uh, data transformation today. So it's already in Glue. It's already in uh, Athena. It's already in EMR, EMR, a couple of the services. Um, they're going, okay, well, now it's in Redshift. You can just run uh, Apache jobs in Redshift. So that, again, it's, I'm not having to move data to do that. Um, the next one was, all right, this was a pretty big one. Right now today, so I, I've, you know, the, the job this year, I've been building a lot of data lakes for customers and managing that and managing that tedious data pipeline, right? Building those things out. Um, one of the hardest things is, okay, I need an interface, right? I need to, like, I need to be able to manage the data catalog. You know, I, I, I didn't get to catch it, but you were talking about uh, MDM on the plant floor. I've been preaching that forever, right? You got to have master data model and you got to have data catalogs that are in context to the person. Like if you get if you get an engineer and he logs into the data catalog and there's everywhere, that is not going to do anything. He he needs context. So they just announced what they call it. I have to look at the names because they Amazon Data Zone. So it's a web portal. You go into the web portal, you can take all the data and all the underlying data catalogs. You can put your taxonomy around it. You can put your organization, like you can make it hierarchical, who can access what. Um, and then it uses ML to start, you know, putting all that together for you. So you now have a web portal so that producers or consumers can go into. The producers can go in and publish data into the catalog, and then the consumers can go in and and, and consume it, right? And it has all the information necessary to be able to uh, grab that data, how soon it's updated. So they've put a governance layer around data lakes that make wow. it uh, super. I haven't seen it yet. I'm look, I'm going to look at it, this, you know, tonight. Um, uh, yeah, I'm they, looking at yeah. the press release. I'm looking at the press release right now uh, from today. It's literally yep. it came out 30 minutes ago uh, on Business Wire. So Berkshire just announced it, and wow. So I would say, based on everything, that's the biggest announcement. Uh, so that's far. a big. Yeah, that's the biggest announcement so far, for sure. Uh, holy crap. Uh, that yeah. is something that Microsoft's got to be freaking out now. I mean, Azure's got to be, because uh, nothing like that exists on the Azure portal. Uh, and I don't know yeah, I mean, if, architecturally speaking, that's something they're going to be able to pull off uh, without well, and fundamental changes. Yeah, that, I mean, and you're seeing that, and 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 in my new role, like I, I work in Azure, right? So I'm 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 studying for my Azure exam, so I can't. I'm not all AWS all the time anymore, but it, it, that's exactly right. I think there's architectural, like fundamental infrastructure capabilities that Amazon has invested in over a long period of time, that other companies simply can't do now because they haven't been investing in doing that. Like this Nitro platform, they're up to version five now. This thing's insane, right? It's it's a hypervisor in a chip. We, it's not software hypervisor. It's a hypervisor and chip, and it enables them to do some things that just you just can't do 
using traditional software approach. Um, well, and I, I also it, think Amazon. I also think Amazon's pure commitment to uh, service-based architecture with yeah. workflow that yeah. their the pure the the one hundred percent commitment to service-based with workflow development has made that has laid all the foundation for interoperability at scale within the AWS infrastructure, which makes something like AWS data zone or Amazon data zone. I think they're calling it right. Data zone possible, yeah. right? You just yeah. put the, put the hat on top of everything. And now you've got, yeah. you have a view into your data. Uh, yeah. That's, that's a huge, I would say anybody who's watching definitely the yeah. biggest announcement is this data zone announcement for sure. Yep. And then I followed up that, like you just kind of capped it with, you know, so QuickSight is their BI tool, right? It's Amazon's BI tool. And it's it's been pretty decent. They've, they've added like 80 features to it this year alone, right? They keep adding to it. It's got a, but the but the coolest thing is to get this thing called QuickSight Q for questions. So you can ask it natural language questions. So you pull your data in, whatever it is, sales, production, quality, whatever. You can say, hey, what are my top 10 defects? over the last two months versus top 10 defects over the last year, right? You can ask it questions like that and it will generate like a charts and graphs and like it builds a dashboard for you based on your questions. Um, so they added to that, so it, it already does that today. So what they turned on today is forecasting. So you can say, what is my quality based on the current data over the next 24 hours, next 30 days, something like that. So oh. it starts doing um, predictive natural language, you know, in QuickSight. That is awesome. Uh, yeah, that was pretty slick. And then they switched over to security and going back to your thing about the interoperability. So Amazon and a whole bunch of other security companies created what's called the Open Cybersecurity Schema Framework. I had no idea until they announced it. Apparently, it's already been in place. But talking about all the security platforms, this is this is important to us as well. Uh, all the security platforms, they spit out logs, right? I don't care, you know, Rapid7, Cisco, whatever else. They split out these logs, and they're all in different formats. They're all in their yep. own formats. Yep. And trying to parse the scheme and pull it all together, it becomes insane. So uh, last year, the OS, the OCSF was put together, and it has all of the, the big players in it. And so uh, the, the next thing is they basically wrapped up a data lake for security. It's Amazon Security Data Lake. And it integrates with all of the, you know, the big players, uh, all the Amazon services and pumps data. Like it's a click button and you set it up and you give it the infrastructure and it just starts dumping security data and helping you. Now you can query, you know, uh, how, many, how many login attempts have been, ha you know, on my routers, you know, corporate wide, you know, how many failed login attempts, how many routers are this? Like you can start asking questions through Athena or other third parties uh, like Splunk to be able to pull that data out. And so they're, they're just putting some framework and some solutioning, which is new, kind of something new that, you know, Amazon builds building blocks, right? We're actually starting to see they're coming up in the solution stack, making it more accessible. And uh, what I would hallucinate, uh, you know, tomorrow is the ML day, like there'll be a lot of ML and data tomorrow. And then uh, Werner, the CTO, he's all over the place. It's awful, always serverless or dev or something like that on Thursday. Uh, we're probably going to see some more solution approaches, in my opinion. Awesome. All right. So, hey, brother, I appreciate you joining. So for those of you watching, everybody should know Michael Brown from the community. But uh, real quick, you know, he used to be a solutions architect with Amazon Web Services. He's now the director of architecture and innovation at RTS, which is Resolve Technical Services, which is an MSCP based here in Dallas. Michael and I have worked together a bunch of times. We're actually meeting with a client here shortly to go over AWS infrastructure. Um, I would just real quick, Michael leads RTS's architecture and innovation practices, by, and they serve their customers by providing advisory services, professional services, and managed services in the following areas, cloud, ERP, security, IoT Edge, enterprise software, and automation, RPA. We will include Michael's contact info in the description if you want to get a hold of him at RTS. And also you can find him in the Discord server. I think it's your at, it's Michael Brown is your name in the Discord server, right? Um, yeah. Michael, brother, I appreciate you joining us, man. Uh, looking forward to working with you again here shortly and uh, be safe. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Michael.